It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to especially give a shout out to Forrest Lucas, who has really stepped up in the Western lands issues uh, with Protect the Harvest and everything that they have done. Forrest, we thank you. You know, it's, it's very hard to sit here and listen to some of these, these talks um, and not have an editorial comment or two. Not about the talk themselves, it's about the, the problem. And I love the word uh, incentivized. I think that's a fascinating word. I think it's a fancy word because I don't work for a publicly owned company and, it, and so I can say these things. I used to work for the mining industry. and. Uh, and I don't work for a company that is on a timeline, has to get along with some regulators to, um, to, to get something done, anything done. But incentivized, I find very fascinating. I think it's a fancy word for a shakedown or extortion. And when you listen to all of these talks and an outline of all of the problems that we're hearing, what we have, in essence, is federal administrative tyranny, wherein we have federally, federal employees who are immune from prosecution, who have enormous power by virtue of their ability to hand down an administrative decision. And in their power, they basically have the power of the judge, jury, and, and um, executioner. And if you really think about it, that's where it all starts. And I think what DeMar Dahl is talking about when we talk, and, and other people, uh, Tim, you referenced jurisdiction, when you talk about transferring the management and administration of these lands to the states, in part, it is to get around or eliminate the ability of federally employed, unaccountable, unionized federal employees from having absolute administrative tyranny over our industries. The other thing that comes out quite clearly is this is nothing short of, and it has been for about 30 years, a federal attempt. I can't speak to the motivation for it. I have no idea why we see what we see happening in the West. It is so counterintuitive um, to what makes sense. But there has been an all-out assault on the West in particular, but it's now spreading onto the private lands as well, in the West in particular, to drive off every bit of production on these lands, whether it be first the timber industry, who were like deer in the headlamps, quite frankly, at the time, who didn't take this issue seriously, and who ended up um, walking away. And now you can go to Burns, Oregon, and you can go to the fanciest shopping mall in town, which happens to be a uh, refurbished mill, sawmill. And that's what we have today for our industry. It's a skeleton of what it once was, or it doesn't exist at all. The same thing is happening with mining. Mining can, can do a lot by, through the enforced shakedown by mitigation, and they have to do it. They have no choice, or they can go somewhere else to mine. But it's kind of hard to pick up a property that's been explored and, and, uh, and developed and move it to Chile. The gold is where it is. The silver is where it's located. The coal is in the ground. The ranching industry is a little bit different. Ranching is not owned, most ranches are not owned by a corporation. Most ranches are owned by families, your family, the Finnicans. And at the end of the day, the person who is um, up against it is an individual or a family. They don't have deep pockets. All they have is the inability, usually, to sell out, and well, if they can sell out, they will, but the inability to just up and leave because usually their entire life's investment, in fact, the investment of generations of people is tied up in that property. And so consequently, what separates the rancher and now the farmer as well, because the farmer is going to be uh, on the front lines of some of this with the Clean Water Act if, if they're able to uh, expand the definitions of the Clean Water Act uh, to employ it to, into non-navigable waters. Um, but at the end of the day, the rancher is at the front of the line on this battle. 
and he has no protection, very little help, and he either fights it or cuts his livestock numbers to the point that he can't run anymore. And it's a, it's a deal that, that is impossible to take. So we have some choices um, in how we proceed in the future. And I look at this meeting, and it's really a meeting of leaders, because I, I know so many of you and all of you in one form or another has been on the front end of this battle, leading this battle um, over many, many years. Some of, us are, some of us are on our second generations. One of the first things that we may have an opportunity in this, um, and I just hope and pray for a good outcome of this election. I sort of like the kick the cans down mentality of Trump, but, that's, uh, but there's no guarantees with anybody who's elected. And, we, and he certainly is an unknown quantity. I hope to God that he understands corporate structure. I think he does. And he will recognize that the bureaucratic corporate structure of our federal, his employees, whoever is elected, whoever the president is, their employees, they serve at his pleasure, how absolutely broken it is and how absolutely lawless it is. Because at the end of the day, when you listen to all of these talks that we just heard before me, so much of what you hear is about bureaucrats who aren't even following their own laws, but they're enforcing petty rules on us, forcing us to comply with them, and if, they, and if we don't, they'll sue us, tie us up in court forever, or they'll surround us with 200 snipers and who have no general grant of law enforcement authority. So it's a no-win situation for us. So I'm hoping um, that he understands that it's very broken. One of the things, you know, I, I worked in Washington for a time, and we always hear about reforming this law and that law. All of my property rights friends on Capitol Hills are always talking about um, reforming the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, NEPA, any one of them, all of them would be great. The problem is, is you almost need a perfect alignment of the stars for any such legislation to ever go through both houses of Congress and be signed by a president. And so here, I've been at it now since 1990, or 1987 in Washington, D.C., and none of these changes have ever happened. We've had little, little fixes here and there, but no major reforms. Here's the sad news. Even if they did reform these laws, and even if we had a Supreme Court that issued magnificent property rights rulings, our federal bureaucrats wouldn't follow them. They don't now. They don't follow US v. New Mexico. They don't follow the laws as written by Congress. Our case is about uh, one incident after another wherein they were in, in clear violation of the laws as written by Congress. So I have a proposal. And I think that this would do more to correct the bureaucratic dysfunction that we have. And that is to eliminate, uh, to a large degree, it'd have to be wordsmithed, we'd need the attorneys to wordsmith it, but to eliminate federal bureaucrats from having automatic immunity from prosecution. In our case, we had a finding from a federal district judge wherein he found evidence of a conspiracy from the government to take our vested water rights on our ranch as well as our, um, as our grazing preferences. In addition to that, he found evidence of fraud, wire fraud, mail fraud, and he found evidence of racketeering. He held that what he saw after a month-long trial and a, and a case that had gone on since 2007, he found that uh, the conduct of the agencies was shocking to the conscience of the court, a finding necessary to bring a Bivens action against the federal employees personally. When we investigated it, and I, and I was talking to Grant Gerber at the time, who, who one of our great heroes on these issues, um, about proceeding with a RICO complaint against the federal government, we were analyzing which way to go and, and how to go about it, and, and working through his law firm and another law firm uh, who would hopefully have a lot of pit bull attorneys in there that um, like treble damages. But anyway, um, unfortunately then, of course, he passed away. But the long and short of it is, I was never greatly encouraged by what the attorney said 
about pursuing a RICO action even after we'd had a judge make a finding of RICO and Nora Bivens' action as well. But put it in this context, if Lois Lerner was sitting there before Congress testifying about her targeting of conservative groups for the, um, uh, with the IRS, an absolutely chilling uh, conduct on the part of a federal bureaucrat, if she was just slightly worried about being prosecuted, do you think her conduct might have been a little different? I don't think it would take too many prosecutions of federal employees personally where they, for a change, can hang out in court for 40 years. Um, personally bringing an action against federal employees that would utterly change the culture of these agencies. And that's what we need. We need good government bureaucrats. We need a few of them, maybe not quite so many, but we need uh, people who are very good at their job, who do their job well, but most importantly, who follow the law. And while they're sitting here telling us that we can't ranch, we have no idea how to ranch without stepping on a tortoise or stepping on a sage hen or some other red herring environmental issue, um, they're telling us that we're not following the law, that we're uh, grazing beyond our stubble height, that we have a, a mind that's in, magically all of a sudden in the middle of a sage, sage uh, grouse habitat, sage chicken habitat, let's rephrase that. <laughs> and, um, and so as a result of this, um, these agencies, uh, w if we could do this, it would completely change the culture of these agencies. I believe they should be held to the same standard as they hold us. And by God, they come down on us hard. <laughs> of course, the other thing that's in the pipeline is all the work. DMAR almost has, has done an enormous amount of work. Um, with, with Grant when he was alive and with a number of other people on this, on this lands transfer issue. Um, I don't know how it would all shake down and I think it would take Congress to be involved in it and to pass a law to actually do it. But nonetheless, the whole concept of bringing management to a local level makes perfect sense. For one thing, we all know these federal agencies can't manage anything without doing it at a horrendous expense and without a bloated budget and without a lot of people standing by a uh, on a shovel or um, standing next to a fire truck or a plane while they watch a fire grow and get big enough so they can actually go fight it. Um, so consequently, the whole issue of bringing things locally, I think, makes a lot of sense. If you look, we've spent a lot of time in courts listening to government attorneys tell the judge, Your Honor, uh, you know, these ranchers, they didn't know how to run these, these rangelands. They needed us to come in here and manage it for them. They're absolute uh, they, that's why we're here, they're incompetent, and all of a sudden the rancher's the village idiot when it, become, when it comes to range management, but the local bureaucrat who has maybe two or four years of school from a, one of our famous land-grant colleges that gins out bureaucrats pretty good, um, they, uh, they all of a sudden are the expert as it relates to range management. So consequently, if we, but their job that they've done over the last 30, 40 years is an absolute disaster. If you look at any forest in the west, drive through any forest, or drive across from I-80 from Reno to Salt Lake, what you see is a sea of um, cheat grass from as far as you can see because it's been burned so many times. If you drive through any forest, they're uh, dying and, and diseased. It was not this way 30 or 40 years ago. It has just been this last period of time where the management has become utter mismanagement and yet they claim we can't do it without them. I think it does need to be brought back to the states. Finally, um, one of my pet peeves, uh, or w the thing that I specialize in, I guess, is, is water and, and documenting water rights. If you look at the western lands and so much of what has happened, um, what you see is an all-out assault on, on water especially. And if you consider that water in, um, aside from maybe striking an oil well on your property, water is perhaps the most valuable asset that we have. And if you look at the western lands, um, aside from municipal and industrial use of water, the rancher and the farmer basically owns and controls most of it. The other thing in all of that is every rancher, every farmer, virtually, except for those who have underground pivots, um, can document that they have vested water rights. So for surface waters, they can document that they have historical rights that are protected by law 
both state law and federal law, rights that predate any one of these federal agencies. And so I encourage property owners, um, as we sit here under all-out assault, to document and do their title work on their ranches and get their ranches, their property, their farms, uh, get their chain of title put together so that they uh, document those property rights and so they're ready for whatever comes their way. I just came uh, from Eureka. I'm working on, the, on a property there that's involved in an in a ugly adjudication uh, versus old historical vested rights and, and uh, new um, uh, pivots that were brought in and where the state over-appropriated a valley. And it's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> As I said, I drove over here on the, on the Pony Express Trail, literally, and, um, and, re and I'm researching the Pony Express Trail. But that is what we need to do. We need to be vigilant as individuals. We can't expect government to come solve it for us. They won't. We need to also be vigilant with regard to our own property rights and understand what they are. And um, I think that is what, in our case, you know, we have We've had tremendous wins at the trial level. We've had tremendous wins at the Fed Circuit. We've had a uh, win, of course, on the water adjudication where we ended up with all of the water on two mountain ranges and in one valley and in the Ralston Valley. So we've been very successful, uh, I would say, on protecting our property rights. Protecting a $14 million judgment, eh, it's a little so-so. <laughs> we're, we're appealing that back up to the Fed Circuit. But either way, it's important. I, we've learned a lot from that, and I strongly urge it. The same thing is applicable for those who are, as I say, for those who live in the East who don't understand our little war in the West, wait for the Clean Water Act and some of its, uh, the attempts to regulate non-navigable waters via the, uh, the Clean Water Act. Now, while you could say the strict language of the Clean Water Act doesn't allow for it, while I think it's, it's ripe for uh, litigation and while it's presently being held up um, by the, some of the appeals courts, which is a good thing, nonetheless, um, this business of government coming in and trying to uh, regulate over the top of your property rights is uh, something that, that private land ranchers and farmers are going to learn about, I think, if the Clean Water Act ever is used as the environmentalists want to use it. So I urge the same thing because what that does is it takes your property rights back to their origin, back to the date of first appropriation and puts those property rights ahead of the 1972 Clean Water Act or the 1934 Taylor Grazing Act, ahead of the Forest Service, ahead of um, the BLM, ahead of any other EPA, any other subsequent law because legislation <laughs> Legislation and my good friend Danny here is the one that, uh, who's a resident expert on some of this stuff, who's done more research on these issues than anybody I know. Um, uh, legislation typically does not reach back in time. Now the attorneys in the room can correct my language because I'm not an attorney, but nonetheless, uh, that in theory, that's how it works. So I urge people to be um, proactive about documenting. This is evidence, documenting their property rights uh, and creating a chain of title and being ready instead of getting caught flat-footed when the government comes after your property. I hope that helps and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Ramona. You'll take some questions, I'm sure. I'm sorry? You'll take some questions. Okay. It was a question. Not a, I'm not telling you you have to. I'm asking. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm ready. I have a I have a question before we get to read. Uh, my friend Chuck Miller and I got in this conversation, and I'm asking you if it matters. We often talk about they. They want to control the water. They want to control the land, the resources. We heard Ronald Reagan speak to the same issues we're dealing with in 1964. So they can't be the Obama administration. Does it matter who they are, and who are they? Oh, I, all I can do is take a wild guess. Um, I think that we're seeing a little bit of it play out. I think this election actually is a play, is a, no matter who we support, um, I think is an indication of a globalist versus nationalist um, mentality as to how we proceed as a nation. And when you look at our Western lands maps in particular, those land status maps that show um, uh, one third of the nation's land, I can't imagine the temptation of a Secretary of State to, who needs bonds, who needs uh, 
loans from foreign powers uh, to be able to say, oh, don't worry about it. Look at this map here. We, we own all this land. Um, it's fully collateralized. We, we can back our debt. You don't have to rely upon the full faith and credit of the U.S. dollar. So I can't, that's a guess, um, but we're so badly indebted as a country, I can't imagine that they wouldn't have uh, hawked the asset, so to speak, uh, to back that debt. Whatever it is, they're serious. They're showing up with guns. They're surrounding ranchers. Um, they're extorting untold millions out of private industry. And you know, Trump keeps talking about companies going abroad. I don't think they're going abroad because of our tax structure as much as anything. I think some that can move abroad and don't have to deal with our bureaucrats find it a lot better to move elsewhere. They even find the communist Chinese better than the American bureaucrats. So I think that, um, I think that our federal agencies have, uh, may have, that these lands may have been used as collateral, but it's, it's purely a guess. You mentioned Danny. I've rooted Danny out. He's sitting right here. Danny Martinez, you wanted to answer that question, and I'm holding the microphone. <laughs> I was serious. I'll answer it. <laughs> okay, the, the, they are the special interest groups have had, that have infiltrated our lawful government and are promoting their own personal agenda. And we're talking about the mm -hmm. environmentalists. The Pseudo-environmentalists. Pseudo-environmentalists, right, exactly. That's who they are, right, Ramona? Oh, yeah. And they're funded by multinational organizations. When you look at, Ron Arnold did a beautiful book, I think, Trashing the Economy, about 10 or 20 years ago, wherein he followed the money on these environmental groups. So when they say pseudo-environmental groups, they're absolutely correct. And more importantly, I always tell people who are dealing with uh, the federal agencies, don't ever kid yourself. They're colluding. The federal bureaucrats are colluding with the environmental groups to get the desired outcome lawsuits that they need, wh whether or not they settle them. And so the communications, I've, <laughs> I've also always said, uh, if you can, the discovery on the communications, for instance, is an example, between Harry Reid, Neil Coonsey, and um, the sheriff of Clark County with regard to the B Bundy situation, I think would be utterly fascinating. Discovery is a wonderful thing sometimes. First question. Uh, you mentioned Reed Smith. You mentioned preparing and um, documenting. In in your present view, are you doing something with the documents in in preparing, or are you just holding the documents for some other trigger event? Are you actually um, are you doing something with the documents? Mainly, what I recommend, uh, th I tell people to get their documents in order because sometimes it takes longer than you would think it would take. It took my mom two years to finish uh, the title work on Pine Creek because we were dealing with seven different ranches and multiple patents. Um, so I, I tell people to get going earlier than later because it can take longer than you expect it to. Um, and then you uh, hold them, if you have any kind of water issue, that chain of title is how you document your uh, the earliest priority date that you can possibly come up with. So you would use those documents in a chain of title and an abstract in a water adjudication. Um, there are other procedural things you can do with the, um, with the BLM and the Forest Service. I'll, I would steer you to Danny Martinez for that. And then if you end up in court, then it is my, uh, one of the things that dad, my father used to always say, we get into court and we, argue about the rules and regulations and to some extent we pick up the wrong end of the legal stick because we don't um, we don't argue about the underlying property rights we can argue about rules and regulations all day long and as we learned in our case we were we won three administrative appeals before we ever went into federal court and it never changed the conduct of the agencies it didn't change a thing so when my father uh, and brother were going through I mean, uh, hundreds of boxes of files. And that's not counting the ones I've got in my possession. I've got hundreds of boxes of files in my possession of court stuff. Um, and they were going through all those administrative appeals. My dad, my dad had my brother back a truck up to the uh, grain bin where those files were stored, two of them. And he took a few things out of those boxes and stuck them in one truck. And he took the vast majority of the range studies all of the uh, range studies in which he'd hired a guy to fi 
fly a twin engine plane down to Pine Creek Ranch and study stubble height. Um, and all of the other matter related to those administrative appeals and put them in that truck. And he said, go drive that down to the dump and light it on fire. And then he wagged his finger at my brother and he said, don't you ever forget this is about property. Don't ever get caught in that quagmire of regulations. So that would, any time you enter, enter into any kind of litigation with these agencies, you need to document with that chain of title that your, um, your, let me put it a little differently. We, especially with Western ranchers on federally administered land, we're not trespassers. We're not interlopers. We're not serfs. We have property rights, in our case, that go to 1865 and have been conveyed by will or deed to the present owner, us, and have been recognized and protected in every land law passed by Congress, federal land law passed by Congress. And so we need to prove that. You can't just go into court, you know, saying, oh, I, I, my grandfather was here in 1860. You can't say that. You've got to have the evidence. The evidence is the chain of title. So just Blair Dunn. Sorry. Thank you. Just very quickly, I think you're probably aware of this, but there was language proposed to Congress concerning the federal overreach or the bullying by the federal government. I, don't, I just want to make sure that people understand that that is in front of Congress at this point. Um, it hasn't gone anywhere. I know our co congressman from New Mexico, Steve Pierce, has a copy of the language that I helped work on. It's there, and it's worth thinking about that in terms of this next election because one of the reasons it's been held and hasn't gone forward is because we had the fear that we'd get it all the way through and it just get vetoed, which is just as bad. So that, it is there, and I, if anybody would like a copy, I'm happy to provide that language. I challenged our congressman from uh, Nevada, Mark Amity, who happened to used to be a U.S. attorney, which always makes me a little suspect. And um, I challenged him. I said, you know, you used to be a U.S. attorney. You ought to be able to find some language. And then I said, slip it into a Harry Reid appropriations bill. It's sure to pass. <laughs> but. Next. Okay, I'm Tara Tenney. And my question is, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this, a loaded question. At what point do the people suffer so much despotism and at what point how many lives need to be destroyed before the people draw that firm line in the sand and say enough is enough. I am declaring my independence from this tyranny. Well I think it's an absolutely um, correct question and your dad raised that question very very eloquently. And um, I think I would put it a little differently. We're sitting in a time, I, I said, I hope you can cut this. <laughs> I said after this last election that this, I took a course in, um, when I was in Europe, in England for college for four months on Hitler Germany. And um, after this last election, I said, this looks familiar to, based on what I had studied at that time. I am deeply concerned and have been deeply concerned about where these federal agencies are going, what they're doing, and how far they'll go. What we saw happen recently was an utter, in addition to a, I won't go, go into all of it, but in addition to everything else that happened, it was an absolutely chilling um, attack on the First Amendment, if nothing else. It was a lot more than that, but that sent, that sent, um, that should, sh that should be of great concern. My take on it is this. We have lawful elections, and God willing, we will have an election in which some of this gets rectified. I don't put faith in politicians, don't mishear me. Um, but I do think that we are at a point in this country where they have pushed not just the rancher, but a whole bunch of people to such a point that they're about done. And we see it manifesting in this election. So my hope is that we don't have to go that far. I would remind people, and we all know that, that we got this country by virtue of a revolution and we never know what can happen in the future. But I would also remind people, if you haven't been to the battlefield of Antietam in Sharksburg, the Civil War, um, that was a Civil War battle that took place there, wherein 60,000 men in a couple of cornfields shot each other. And so the, the 
we have to be ready to deal with tyranny. I agree. But are we there yet? We very may, well may be. But I am hopeful in this next election that we may see some changes. I think that what happened in Oregon got a lot of people's attention and woke a lot of people up, I hope. If not, we don't know where it's going to go. I have time for one more question. It's over here. This is my Phil Donahue part. I am Elaine Smith from Grant County, Oregon. And quite a few years, you were in John Day right. at a seminar, and you had a booklet that showed how to trace your property rights back. Are those still available? Yes. I've given mine away, <laughs> <laughs> loaned them. So, uh, and where can I get them? I'll, I um, come up to me afterwards, I'll give anybody that um, wants that, a, just I'll get your email and email it to you, so that's great. I had a funny story from that John Day seminar. Um, Wyatt Ayer, uh, where's Ronnie? Anyway, I was up in Cody, Wyoming, and I gave a little, I spoke up there and then gave a little title work seminar afterwards to some farmers and ranchers there. And I, they happened to let in a uh, guy who was a retired um, forest supervisor of the, of that, in that forest, Bighorn Forest, I think it was. And of course, Angus here is a recovering forest, super, or forest service employee, so I, I hold out hope for our, our bureaucrats. And so I didn't want to write the guy off altogether, but I didn't know why he was there. And I figured if he came there wired and ready to take notes on me and my presentation, I was going to give him something to talk about. So I, I gave him a lot to talk about and a lot to record. But one of the things I said, in these land issues, you have to be so careful who you hire as an attorney. And we have been through, we have hired a lot of attorneys, we've had some very good ones, and we've uh, dodged some major bullets with some other ones. And um, so I went on about being careful who you hire, and for God's sakes, check their record, and so on and so forth. And a guy came up to me afterwards who was from John Day, and he said, I said, I said if you, and if you're not real careful, you can end up with a very expensive settlement and less property rights. He came up to me at dinner afterwards and he said, I'm one of those attorney, I mean, I'm one of those people that ended up with less property and a very expensive settlement plus attorney's fees. <laughs> and it was, he was from John Day, Oregon. He'd heard us talk in John Day, Oregon. Anyway. One, one more thing, Ramona, and then we'll let you off. Uh, Ramona, when we were in court recently in San Francisco. Oh, hi. Um, I was stunned, and you can clarify this, but we're going to be talking about education later and helping people communicate about these issues. The judge actually questioned why the Hage family, if they had rights to the water, why on earth would the cows have to graze on the way to the water? Can you talk about that for just a second? Have you ever run into a buzz saw or a blast furnace? That's all I can describe. That's the only way I can describe that hearing. We had three women justices, that, no mark against them, just they were three women, who also happened to be appointed by um, Obama and Clinton. And, and there's been some good justices appointed by Obama and Clinton even, so I didn't want to write them off until they opened their mouth. Now keep in mind, we talk about ethics and all that and the government following its own laws, one of the places that needs a serious house cleaning is the Department of Justice. These attorneys are liars, unethical, and they don't, they don't care what they say to a federal court. We had one of the attorneys tell us in our trial that, um, that if they weren't real concerned about what Judge Jones would do because they could get anything they wanted from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And I didn't, I honestly didn't take that terribly seriously. I knew we were going to get hit by the Ninth Circuit. I knew they weren't going to be our best friend. I knew that they were going to attack that decision. I didn't, attack, I didn't um, expect a decision from Mars. And then we had these attorneys stand up, the one in particular, in both the Federal District Court, Federal Fed Circuit Court of Appeals, same attorney, and the Ninth Circuit, and she stood up for her 15 minutes, started misrepresenting the law and the facts of the case to the court, and never quit doing that until she sat down. 
So when we have these issues before these courts, um, especially western rangeland ranching, I would say the same is probably true for mining. It is, you're dealing with an uphill battle of convincing somebody who has no idea what the back end from the front end of a cow is, or much less that a cow actually puts her head down to drink and then, oh, by the way, might graze as well. And as I say, you know, even bureaucrats mow their front lawns. But it's almost, you almost have to make it that simple for them because they're so far removed from agriculture, from production of any sort, that they have no point of reference, they have no understanding of, of how this works, and it is especially a problem for rangeland ranching. Thank you, Ramona. Ramona will be back Thank tonight. You. Ladies and gentlemen, Ramona Morrison. Thank you.